Hey guys, in this particular video, what I'm going to be doing is showing you a fairly simple friction problem. So let's get started. Let's say that we've got an incline just here. And that on this incline, we've got a block of mass M1 resting on it. And that block is connected to another block via a pulley, via a pulley just here, to another mass M2. And my question to you is, what is the condition that must be necessary for this block one to be moving down the hill? Basically, I need you to come up with an inequality which, can, which tells me what must be true for this block M1 to move down the hill or, if you like, for this mass 2 to start raising upwards, right? And in order to do this, we need to know a few things. First of all, we need to know that the friction between this incline and our mass M1 has a, has a coefficient of static friction mu s. The angle of the incline is theta, okay? And I'm defining the axis y to be um, perpendicular to the slope and x to be tangential to the slope. All right, so this is the point where you pause your video, you come up with your own solution, and then when you've found your own solution, resume the video and see how, how you went compared to how I went. Okay, so let's get started. First things first, free body diagrams. Let's do the free body diagram of our second mass first because it's simpler. We've only got two forces acting on it. It's going to be the force due to gravity of M2G, and we're also going to have a tension in the rope trying to pull it up of T. And notice these two forces will only be equal to each other if the acceleration of mass M2 is zero. What else? Well, we've also got our second, sorry, our first block, our first block, which is a little bit more complicated. Um, we're going to have a force due to gravity still. That's going to be M1G. But we're also going to have a normal force, which is going to be acting perpendicular to the slope of magnitude N. We're also going to have that same tension force because I've made the assumption that the rope is of negligible mass and the pulley has negligible friction. And here's the trick. I'm also going to assume that the friction force is acting up the hill. So I'm going to assume that there's a friction force acting up the hill. In true reality, this is a purely generalized equation, so a generalized set of variables. So I don't know if the friction force is up the hill. It could be down the hill. There could be no friction force at all, for all I know. But I'm going to assume that there's a tendency for the block to move down the hill. That's why um, the friction force is up the hill. That's, that's the assumption I'm making to solve this problem. Okay, um, let me just zoom out a little bit so we can see all of that a little bit clearer. Okay, so let's, let's, let's talk about formulas we can use to solve this problem. The biggest formula we're going to end up using is the sum of forces equal to ma. So in other words, we can express this as the sum of forces, the sum of forces on block 1 in the y direction is going to be equal to the mass of your block 1 times by your acceleration in your y direction. Another big formula we're going to end up using is the sum of forces on block 1 in the x direction is going to be equal to your mass of your block 1 times by the your acceleration in your x direction. Right? Um, and here's an interesting point. We can also use um, acceleration x for our second block as well. It might be a little bit tough to imagine, but think about it. If your mass 1 moves up this hill by a certain amount, that means your mass 2 will be moving downwards, vertically downwards, by the same amount. Same rule for acceleration. So that we could also write then that the sum of forces sum of forces on your second block is equal to the mass of your second block times by the acceleration AX, right? Because the, the acceleration AX is shared between M1 and M2. Okay, so let, let's, let's, let's try and simplify, well, let's try and plug in these values to see if we get to any interesting conclusions. Okay, well, first of all, let's see, what are the sum of forces in our y direction for block one? So I'm evaluating this formula first. Well, um, we've got our n normal force, which is, which is in the direction of y, so that's going to be n right here. But we've also got our component of gravity, which is downwards as well. And let me just do that right here. Just imagine this force being split into two components, horizontal, uh, tangential and normal. So let me just do that to the side here because I don't want to clutter things up a little bit. This is our force M1G and I want to split it into X and Y components. So this is going to be our X component just here and this is going to be our Y component just here. right? We know that this angle here is theta. 
right? This is pure geometry at this point, right? Which means that we know that this angle here is 90 minus theta, which means we know this angle here is theta, meaning that we know this component of our force is going to be m1g cosine theta, and we know that this component of our force is going to be m1g sine theta, all right? Okay, so that basically means that we can now um, distribute this force into x and y components, meaning that our meaning that this term right here can now be expressed as our normal force in a y direction minus m1g times by let's see it'll be cosine cosine theta those are all the forces acting in the y direction is going to be equal to m1ay okay while we're sorting this out let's see if we can figure out some more interesting things well, we know that our acceleration in our y direction is always going to be equal to zero. That's true even if this block is sliding up or down the hill or not, right? We know that because the block isn't going to be going into the ground and it's not going to be coming out of the surface. It's going to be stuck to the side of the hill, right? So that means our acceleration in our y direction is going to be zero, meaning that this entire term gets canceled off to zero, meaning that we're left with our normal force will always be equal to m1g cosine theta. Okay, that'll play a part to play in the future. Let's zoom out a little bit more. I feel like I'm getting a little bit too tight in here. Okay, so let's see if we can analyze this formula now. Right over here. I know it's getting a little bit messy, but bear with me. I'm going to analyze that formula now. Same block, block one. What are the forces acting on it in the x direction? Well, we've got our tension force, right, because that's in our positive x direction. That's in our positive x direction. What else is in our positive x direction? It's, in our, it's our friction force as well, right? Our friction force, but our force due to gravity is not. That's minus m1g sine theta, right? I'll scroll up so you can see. That's this one right here, m1g sine theta, and that's going to be equal to your mass times your acceleration, right? So that's going to be another big formula, which we'll be messing around with as well, right? What about this formula? What does this boil down to? Let me just... Let me just put a box around that. What does this formula boil down to? Well, we know that the sum of forces um, on our second block is just going to be m2g minus t is equal to m2ax, right? Notice it has to be this way around because um, the acceleration is positive downwards. That's ax. Okay, so let's put a box around all of these formulas right now and let's see what we can conclude from this. Okay. For the sake of finding out what the friction force must be for the block not to move downhill, I'm going to evaluate the case where a, a subscript x is zero. So I'm going to consider I'm going to consider the acceleration in the x direction of our block one is equal to zero. I'm going to consider this case. I'm not saying it is. I'm just going to consider what the friction force must be in order for the block not to move. Okay, so using this right now, we can simplify this formula and we can simplify this formula. Let's do that. Well, we know that once you simplify this formula, and I know this is getting messy, but I hope you'll bear with me, that'll be equal, that'll be T plus your friction force minus M1G sine theta is equal to zero, right? This, this cancels off to zero if we take the assumption that the block isn't moving, right? Meaning that we can solve for our friction force now, meaning that our friction force must be equal to M1G sine theta, sine theta, M1G sine theta minus our tension force. Okay, so now that we've got that sorted, let's see, and, and let, me, let me just reiterate what this actually means. This is the friction force that must be in order for the block not to move downhill. Okay, um, let's see if we can simplify this one as well. Well, in order for the block not to be moving downhill, that means A subscript X is zero, meaning that M2G m2g minus t is also equal to zero, implying then that your tension force must be equal to m2g. Makes sense, right? Um, well, now we can just play the game of substitution and plug t into here, meaning that we're left with our friction force must be equal to m1g sine theta 
sine theta minus m2g in order for the block not to move downhill. But we're not done here, right? We know that our friction force meets a limit. We know that our friction force doesn't just get larger and larger and larger. It actually has a maximum value, right? In fact, we can say that if, if our friction force is greater than our maximum friction force, then the block will slide down the hill. Now, why will the block slide down the hill? That's because if the friction force required to keep the block stationary is greater than the maximum friction force it can have, then it's got no choice. It, it, it literally cannot support what's necessary for it to stay up, meaning that it will slide down the hill. I hope that makes sense. So basically, if our friction force is greater than the maximum friction force it can have, then the block then the block will slide down the hill. It's got no choice. It's got to do that. Okay, so let's we can actually plug this formula now into our inequality. This is a huge substitu substitution game, by the way, as, as you may be guessing, right? Meaning that we get the inequality m1g sine theta minus m2g is going to be greater than our maximum friction force, right? But we know but we know that the maximum friction force is equal to mu s n. This is an experimentally verified fact, right? Um, so that means that we can literally substitute even more stuff into this inequality, meaning that we can say m two g sine theta sine theta minus m two g must be greater than mu s n in order for the block to slide down the hill. But where do, how do we solve for this n? Well, we did it earlier. If we scroll up, right? I mentioned that n is going to be equal to n is going to be equal to m1g cosine theta regardless of whether the block is moving down the hill or not. So we can just plug that in now. We can just plug that in. So we're left with m2g sine theta minus m2g must be greater than mu s times m1g cosine theta, right? This is the inequality that must be true in order for the block to slide down the hill. So now it becomes a game of rearrangement. I'm going to choose to make m2 our subject of our equation, right? But this is really our, our final answer. Um, so I'm I'm going to take m2 over to that side and I'm going to bring this over to the left hand side, meaning we're going to be left with m, sorry, this should be m1. I don't know why I've been writing m2. This should be m1. Oh. There we go. Sorry, I hope I haven't confused you guys there. So this should be m1 times by g sine theta, g sine theta minus, because we're bringing this over, mu s, no, not m1, I'm factoring that out, g cosine theta, cosine theta, is going to be greater than m2g. We can divide both sides by gravity, noticing that it's positive and it doesn't change the sign of the inequality, right? Meaning that we're left with m2 must be less than m1 times by sine theta minus mu s cosine theta. This is our answer. This is our answer. This is the inequality that must be true for the block to slide down hill. This is what must be true. And notice that it meets your intuition as well. Basically, if you were to um, increase your mass m1, then, um, your, then your object will be more likely to slide downhill. And, and this is really um, demonstrated through this formula, right? It means that the mass m2 needs to be lower if your mass m1 is just higher. I hope that makes sense, guys. This is actually a much longer way than what would be required to solve a problem like this. But when you get into it, um, you're going to find out you can take lots of shortcuts. You wouldn't, you can, for example, substitute mu s n as your friction force right off the bat, and that'll speed things up a bit. Nonetheless, I decided this is a great way to introduce you guys to this particular problem. Okay, thanks, guys.